You're listening to this special episode release of The Dental Guys, Unemployment, Loans, and the CARES Act, What to Do Now. It may be April Fool's Day, but this show is no joke. Chris Mahan returns to decipher what we know, what we don't know, and what the most recent information directs us to do in our practices today. You won't want to miss this one coming up right now on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out The Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. And we're live. Welcome to this special episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. I'm John, The Dental Guy, and we are back with Chris Mahan of Mahan & Associates to discuss the ongoing, continuing saga you should be doing today in your dental practice in this crazy, crazy world we live in. Welcome back, Chris. Hey, thanks, guys. How you doing? Well... I mean, it's kind of like one of those answers, you know, like people give you when you see them in the store and they're like, how you doing? Oh, great. Doing great. Hey, how you doing? You know, we've got our coffee and cookies. Do you have bourbon? <laughs> <laughs> I just happened to notice the shirt. It's mm, casual, it's work casual Wednesday at Mayhan and Associates. I mean, and- we wake up in the morning and we work out and uh, then we wait. And we wait yeah. on what? Like my uh, wife was going to bed the other night and she was like, so check your schedule, right? And she was like, hey, there's nothing. And what are we doing next week? And nothing. And what are we doing the Uh, two weeks from now? And nothing. So my, so let me tell you what's happening to me. I have been, I'm going to just admit it. My thumbs are sore from all of the scrolling and texting and responding to emails on my phone. Like, I feel Good like thing you don't have a Blackberry. Grade. Those hard I keys like, would just rip I, your face. Yeah, I feel like I'm in seventh grade again playing like Sonic the Hedgehog, you know, like for eight hours straight because it's the, I've been just nonstop looking, doing, doing what I, I really shouldn't be doing, which is looking John, at my phone. John, do you need a massage? I, I, I need a thumb massage. Well, you can't get one right now. <laughs> Turns out they're all shut down. Yeah. <laughs> So, but I mean, these are the, these are the, the problems we have right now. It's, it's just like wanting a, uh, direction, wanting yeah. a, you know, a purpose and kind of trying to do what we can to control what we can control. Right. And obviously, you know, we've been busy. It's just been busy with things that just aren't that great to be busy with, you know, for yeah. instance, unemployment claims, let's just start right there. And let's talk about that. I mean, we've, uh, Wes and I both have, uh, you know, gone through that process with our team of temporary layoffs. And Chris, I want to bring you in here and just kind of tell us what are you at this point advising as far as unemployment? What's the status of this, you know, supercharged unemployment benefit? Are people getting it? You know, kind of just talk through where we are with unemployment and what we should be doing in our offices. Gotcha. Well, every uh, the Department of Labor and unemployment office in the country is backlogged. Right. <laughs> They're underwater. Um, we have at least a 10 day wait period on the temporary mass layoff forms in Tennessee. Um, they're backlogged in Kentucky. They're backlogged in Minnesota. They're back they're everywhere is backlogged. So even if you expedite it with temporary mass layoff forms or the like, whichever state you know has those uh, whichever requirements they have, um, you're looking at probably two to three weeks before any, before it's processed and any funds are released to your team members. Now they will pay, be paid retroactively from the filing date. So that's the good news. It's just, you know, a little concerning to see if they can, they can make it until then, which hopefully they can. Um, That's just a challenge going on right now is getting them on the unemployment rolls. Um, That additional, you know, the enhanced, the enhanced federal unemployment options that came through with CARES, came through with, you know, the first thing was the pandemic unemployment compensation. That was the additional $600 per week that you'll see uh, per team member. Uh, Some, which is pretty healthy, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, some, some team members will be making more money on unemployment than they were otherwise, which I know is a concern. Uh, but, uh, but I assure you that once practices get back to operations, uh, if an employee says they're not coming back. And I've also read through HR um, publications that even if they say they're not coming back due to their own individual Corona concerns, they'll still be ineligible for unemployment comp. So they can't ah. play that card. Not that they ever would, but you know, there are some, some people out there that'll, you know, take it as far as they can go, especially if they're making more money. And, mm. you know, unfortunately, so just to throw that out there, um, if it's a, if, if they voluntarily have their self, you know, quarantine once this is over due to their own individual concerns, uh, unemployment will not be benefits will not be paid. Okay. So that's the $600 okay. right there. Then they also have an additional 13 weeks of unemployment and that's the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, uh, provision. And that's also where they, they waive the week lag. So typically they have a week lag in somebody filing for unemployment. Um, before they start getting benefits. And they do this to incentivize team members to just not quit, a, you know, to not just hop on unemployment. They want to incentivize them to go get another job, right? Mm. Um, mm -hmm. So they've, they've waived that, and the federal government is reimbursing the state unemployment agencies for going ahead and paying that first week right out of the gate due to this pandemic. Okay. Um, so that at least helps them at, once they are certified to get it a little quicker. Exactly. And there's another thing that's really important that I think is a, a good component of this. You know, again, I think the federal government has really stepped up. They have stepped up as big as we've ever seen them step up. And I know it's not as fast for everybody and we can critique, you know, certain things. But in my opinion, I would give it, you know, a nine out of a 10 score. And I'm and I never give a 10. Right. I'm, I'm that guy that never ranks anything a 10, even if it's perfect. Right. Um, now, that being said, I think they've really stepped up. And here's where the pandemic unemployment assistance uh, comes through. And that's um, for workers who no usually don't qualify for unemployment, such as self-employed individuals, right? You know, Wes, John, if your offices are shut down effective, you know, March 13th, you can file on your own behalf for March 13th, get retro pay. And let's just say it's the 600, the federal subsidy, right? That's $2,400 a month of money coming to you guys through this point in time. Um, and I'm not saying you guys, but I'm using that as an example. Um, independent contractors, some of your 1099, um, you know, that we have really good vendor relationships with people that come in and do contract labor for us and that kind of thing. Um, so that's huge. Now, that, but those three things, back to your original question, John, they have not fully been integrated into the state unemployment agencies yet. They're still working on that because this is all moving really rapidly on how they do it. So, so you're saying that for people like us, for owners, that there's not currently a mechanism or a, a, a way to uh, tap into that, but that there may be uh, in the future the ability to even draw unemployment as an owner? Yeah. And again, I see this happening where, you know, you probably won't get it. I mean, again, the state websites will say coming in days. It says, watch, watch for it. It's coming. Right. And the day it comes, you know, we want to file for all of our practice owners. Right. Um, now, if they were like S corps and being paid W2 wages, we already can get them on the, on the unemployment rolls because they were paying unemployment premiums all these quarters on themselves, um, on the S corps, on their, on their spouses, on their kids, that kind of thing. Um, but if you're not, then this gives you a provision basically to say, Hey, you can go back and get some relief. Uh, again, how this is all playing out is you probably look at probably, I would say four weeks. If they give you, if they come out with their application for self-employed individuals tomorrow, we file it, it'll be four weeks till you get a check. And that's just my, my crystal ball, right? Mm. But you'll get retroactively to the date of office closure. So hey, okay. every little bit helps, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, but it's, <clears throat> it's good to know this because when our team members are calling us, uh, asking us, hey, you know, I thought you said I was going to draw unemployment benefits and I haven't heard anything. Uh, it could be a little while until they not only hear that they're certified to receive them, but also till they actually start getting them. And I guess that puts us kind of in an interesting situation, Wes. I mean, if you're, you know, you have somebody who's struggling to make a rent payment or car payment or whatever, and, you know, you've told them, hey, we're going to unemployment, this is going to be great. And then they, yeah. they can't get it or at least can't get it quickly enough. 
I mean, that's going to, that's going to be difficult. I know we were talking before the show about, you know, some practices trying to decide, like, do I somehow front them a little money or help them out? And, you know, well, John, I, we talked I, about that a little bit. Is. I mean, that's kind of a tough thing. You know, I, I've, I've told every team member, you know, we're having a weekly team meeting at, <clears throat> and, and it's been, it's been good, you know, and really what we talked about is, you know, business things to this point and maybe a few little personal development things that you could be doing. But uh, when it comes to this cash layout, right, of like, do you mm-hmm. help an employee, um, you know, with a problem that they might have? Um, I think it's a case by case basis. I, I myself had, you know, told all of my pl- employees individually, I pulled them aside and I said, look, if you need anything, right, you need to let me know. And and also, I'm passing on information, you know, to them. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I'm communicating to them. Because, again, you're still trying to kind of create a sense of, like, I care about you because we do, right? We want them to come back to work for us. Right. And, um, you know, I don't know about you, John, but, I mean, like, we've been, you know, blessed enough. And, you know, we've got lines of credits. We've got some cash set aside. And, you know, we've we've got some things in place to where we, if somebody needed some money, we could figure out how to get them some money, you know? And I think that, you know, you have to kind of decide what you're going to do, you know? And, um, so yeah, but I'm, I mean, I, but then again, Chris, you had said that even if it takes a while for this to go through, it's not that they're missing out on their benefits. So if we've, you know, we've put the paperwork in, we've done everything we need to do, it may take a little longer, but they're going to get retroactively paid their benefits up from the day that we submitted the paperwork. Right. Can we, so we can at least tell them that. Correct. And that, that is my understanding. And, you know, and I've seen that from department of labor, especially in Tennessee. Uh, I don't see how they wouldn't retroactively do it due to the fact that they're inundated. Uh, this agencies, they're inundated by historical, you know, mass claims that, that no one's ever seen before right so they just need time they've already got the funding the federal government's backing it so yeah they'll so the way i look at it is you know i would anticipate by april 15th everybody will get the the stimulus checks um and that's 1200 per taxpayer 500 per per dependent and that will help bridge a gap and then by the end of the month i think that uh the unemployment distributions will be going uh pretty readily and they'll have a catch-up check in addition to ongoing weekly support if they qualify gotcha so that I think is kind of, we're doing the best we can. And, you know, there are some practices that are keeping people on, um, maybe practices that have, that feel that they have enough emergencies that they can, you know, support their team or at least partially support their team. But I think in general, most people are moving toward this temporary layoff. Um, but the big elephant in the room here really is what comes next with, the the cares act the the paycheck protection program loan um let's dive right into that because you know last time we talked to you you had said hey you know mnuchin the the secretary of the treasury is saying we're going to try to make this available as soon as possible we really want to see this happen asap and we were all kind of thinking or at least maybe thinking that well this is okay this is a three or four week time we're going to be out of the office um you had kind of cautioned us a little bit hey it might not be quite that but you know it it's something now that it seems like it's evolving and the big thing with this loan is that there's a time frame put on this when you get the funds you have eight weeks and you can speak to this but from what i understand you've told me eight weeks to spend this so the big questions are should we be applying for this right now? Because the applications are now, you know, kind of coming out. They're saying they're mm-hmm. going to start accepting them pretty soon. So what's the time frame need to look like for this for us? Who needs to be, what, what do we need to be doing? Give us some guidance on that. Um, yeah, that, that's the hot ticket right now, the Paycheck Protection Program. And, you know, Mnuchin said last, last Tuesday in a press conference, he said, by next Friday, applications will be available and it'll be same day funding. And as recently as this this Tuesday, I was like, no way, no way. There's no way it can happen. Well, surprisingly, the applications are coming online potentially Friday. Right. And everybody's running at it. Uh, you know, I got banks and bankers going to a lot of my clients going, 
get it now, get it now. Here's the application, get ready, submit it. We'll have it sitting queued up waiting for you and get you the money. I think that there's maybe a reason to pause with that strategy. And the reason being is that that uh, paycheck protection program is not there to subsidize or supplement or unemployment. Unemployment's there when the office is not open making money, right? You know, I mean, un unemployment is there as, as support from our infrastructure and in our, in our systems to help subsidize everybody through these very hard times because payroll is the biggest expense on anybody's books. Uh, and again, we love our teams and we love our offices, but our number one priority in this as business owners is to compartmentalize and really set aside that our number one ethical responsibility is to make sure there is a thriving, vibrant office to come back to when the doors are open, right? So I think that the timing of this, if you go and apply for it today, Robert, let's say Friday, let me pull up, we'll just do an eight week countdown. If you apply for it Friday, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that means that you're out of money on may 29th right that right. means you would so, and, and what you mean by that is is that if you get the money on friday let's just say right. you have eight mm -hmm. weeks from that day to spend it if you want it to be forgivable right if you want it to be exactly. forgivable so you could get that right. money and you could mm -hmm. say we got till may 29th but if your people aren't working one of the main forgivable parts of this loan is supposed to be for payroll so you're not paying any payroll so you're sitting right. on all this money that they've loaned you, and you can't even you can work to use expenses, it. But you can't even use it, and then it's you're still then you're gonna have to pay it all back, right? Right, right. The power is utilizing the leverage of this this tool for the forgiveness provision. You know, they they say there's no such thing as a free lunch. We've got eight weeks of free lunch, right? Um, and and that's what it's there for. And yeah, you don't want to get caught. You don't want to get caught coming in and being a you know an innovator or an early adopter with this deal and say, great, you know, mate, because what, what they'll do is they'll come in and potentially put their staff back on a full payroll, even if they're closed. And then what happens when this gets extended till you know June fifteenth or heaven forbid July sixth? Then are you going to have to have those conversations with your staff again, going? Hey, I put you back on the payroll. Everybody had a good eight week run. We've got another six weeks. So I got to go back and do another temporary mass layoff form with the state. And you got to wait another three weeks to get paid because they're still backlogged. And that's just a conversation nobody wants to have with team members. And, you know, it's just a sober conversation that you have to have saying, we're playing this for the long game. We're playing this to make mm -hmm. sure that our staff come back. This is there to subsidize businesses when they open. This is there to subsidize businesses when they open and it doesn't pop back as fast as we may have thought it would. You know, mm -hmm. I do believe you know, in my heart of hearts that when society reopens for business, it's going to be exciting, right? But I don't know if it's going to be exciting day one. I think there's going to be a lot of anxiety, a lot of changes, a lot of changes to our practice operating protocols and procedures and compliance and everybody's gonna get comfortable with that and there may be a lag before everybody's just blowing up the dental offices to come in and get their get their profies and exams and crowns right um their cosmetic procedures they went all on fours they may wait a minute just to kind of see what happens and a lot of times in these types of situations whether it's 07 08 2001 whatever the case may be People are very cautious when they get back in the pool, right? They got to get their toes in the pool. And so this funding is there to supplement the practices for the likelihood or the businesses for the likelihood that day one, it's just not, you know, we're running four columns of hygiene <laughs> and working on Saturdays. I hope that's the case, but it's there to protect you guys. So you're not drip, dropping into your escrow accounts, your savings accounts and your line of credits just until you get back up and going full steam which I'm highly confident that we will in short order, but eight weeks gives us a window to do that and be business and financially responsible on how we utilize mm -hmm. these tools. I want to ask this is why are you bullish on that? Like, because there's some people that aren't bullish enough to say that we're mm -hmm. just going to be guns blazing. I mean, I've mm -hmm. seen it across the, you know, <clears throat> the media in the dental world that there are some people that are saying that it's going to be, it's going to be bad. Right. It's going to be. And then there's some people just taking the middle ground on this and saying, eh, 
it's going to be good for a little bit and then it's probably just going to roll off a little bit. I mean, you're you're being pretty bullish and you have been from the very beginning. What what are you basing that on? Well, I think that, you know, in terms of I just think that everybody's been pinned up for 2 weeks right now, right? And all you see on Facebook is, you know, remakes of Adele songs, you know, see you from the inside and, and you know everybody's going to be itching to get back out and get back to normal as soon as possible um and i think that w especially with the stimulus platform that they've provided there's going to be a lot of money in a lot of pockets i mean just think about it i mean even on the unemployment roll and the in the in the um the the credit the checks coming from the federal government to the taxpayers you're looking at a family of four getting $6,800 this month. And that was just for one unemployment claim. You throw the other one on there and that family of four is gonna come through and get you know 10 grand this month, sitting at home watching Netflix. You know, Thank God Ozark season three just came out, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, you're so right. And that's, that's the feeling I get is that, you know, that demographic, which is our kind of bread and butter dentistry, you know, the, the, the worker, that is, you know, blue collar or even white collar workers who are at home uh, drawing unemployment, and they're going to come out. I mean, they, they're not spending money on much right now. They can't. Mm -hmm. And they're but they're drawing this huge amount in. Um, there may be an effect on short term on people that depend on the stock market for their, you know, their income or their security. But I think, uh, you know, again, depends on who you talk to. No one knows the future. But once we have an answer to a lot of these questions about like a vaccine or, you know, just successfully kind of overcome the first big hump, uh, probably the market's going to respond positively as well. But I think your bread and butter people that have insurance that have, uh, you know, their jobs back. I mean, like you say, they're going to have money to spend. And I think there's going to be a, a desire to return to normalcy and get back into the routines that is probably going to be like nothing we've ever seen in our in our careers. I mean, could we be looking at the biggest bread and butter get it fixed mentality from a patient standpoint that we've ever seen just because we have the one we have some funds that we can now spend. I mean, it's kind of like, hey, here's some money, right? Here's your deductibles, right? Yeah. Here is your here's your cash, right? Now go get fixed and infuse mm -hmm. it, you know? Are we as dentists, right, just going to roll back in there? It's going to be crazy balls to the wall. I mean, like, you know, for yeah. you know, a couple months, but then it's going to come down just a little bit. And then mm -hmm. are there going to be some procedures, John? I just wonder, you know, this is kind of a little bit a little bit off topic. We'll get back to the main thing here. But are there going to be some procedures that are going to be you know, maybe slowed down just a little bit that normally like some of our regenerative procedures that you and I do yeah. quite a bit of, you know, are we going to see think that so. kind of slow down? I think, I mean, that's my crystal ball and I don't know, you know, but my crystal ball projection <laughs> is that yeah. we're going to see, we're going to be doing a lot more basic dentistry uh, mm. for at least a few months, I would guess, yeah. than we are regenerative dentistry. Uh, that's as the kind of camp I think more... I'm falling into really is, yeah, I think and, it's you know, be bread and, and butter. I talked to a good friend of ours. Uh, I'd love to put together a, a, a show on talking about new dentists coming out of school and how they should respond to that as far as education. So we can definitely talk more about that because I think right now the focus is on, you know, basic dentistry and continuing to get good at basic dentistry because that's mm -hmm. what your patients are going to need uh, yeah. pent up. But I, but getting back to the question of of this loan, and we had a great question from from one of our uh, listeners as as we're going here on the live feed. Justin asks, uh, not Justin Goodbread, but different Justin, <laughs> asks, uh, is there a chance of missing out on the money if we wait too long to submit our application for the 7A? This is the sky is falling sphere <laughs> because on the actual uh, attachment that came with the application to me from my bank, uh, <laughs> I mean, he specifically says on there that, you know, there is a possibility that funds could run low. It doesn't say they will run out, but it does say there is a funding. It says right here, we encourage you to apply as quickly as you can because there is a funding cap. I'll just How echo that. How real is that? 
Yeah, I'll just echo that too, because yesterday, and I carbon copied uh, Chris and, and Justin Goodbread on it, and I received an email from my bank with the loan application attached to it. I replied all, said, should I fill this out now? Chris, what do you what do you think, right? Where are we at with this? Most bankers that I've, I've discussed this with, um, <clears throat> and, and I've seen assurances by Mnuchin, uh, and our and Congress t- already talking about phase four of the relief, and they have said multiple times, "Do not worry about the funding for the Paycheck Protection Program." They've got three hundred and fifty billion dollars, and the only problem with a number that high is I can't get it to work in Excel or on my calculator because it has letters in the number now. <laughs> but but you know if you come in and think about there's what there's three hundred million small businesses in the United States. And out of the 300 million, only 100 million actually have employees or some number similar to that. You got to kind of divide it and, and try to, you know, get back into it. But I don't think they're going to run out of money. I don't think that if you wait, you know, the optimal funding date, if you wanted to have it based off of the forgiveness period, which expires, um, or sorry, the funding period that you have to use the money by June 30th, 2020, your optimal funding date will be Cinco de Mayo. May 5th is almost eight weeks specifically up till June 30th, right? Um, I don't think between, you know, we'll watch it. And again, this is a case by case basis because, I mean, guys, we've had what three or four podcasts now. And if we go back and play the first one, probably 50% of our assumptions, assumptions and what we had heard and what we had researched and seen have changed. I mean, these goalposts change almost daily. Uh, but I'm not worried about, I'm not worried about sitting back and waiting. I'm not, one thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to run to get it. If, if, if we sit here two weeks down the road and they say we have funded $200 billion in two weeks, then I'll say go, <laughs> right? Go, yeah. go, go. We'll figure it out later. But uh, I'm just not ready to hop in, hop in like crazy right now because I have a personal opinion that additional funding is coming if they run out of money. They are not going to leave half the small businesses hanging. They yeah. will put whatever they need to into this, period. The end. Yeah. That's one thing that you've seen the United States government. We talk about it and whether we're watching, you know, Fox News or or CNBC or CNN and we're all yapping at each other, hating our government. This is a beautiful point where they've come together mm-hmm. and really stepped it up for United States citizenry. And I yep. think they will continue to step it up no matter what. They are not going to leave us hanging. They're not going to let us come back to work until they have a it's not a flattening the curve. They're going to have to have the curve pinned down with their with the with their hand on the throat of it before they're going to let this come back because they can't afford to have a second wave right they can't mm-hmm. afford to have everybody come back prematurely so they're going to they're going to subsidize and supplement everything they do to protect our economy protect our businesses and protect us um, as we go now people can talk about long-term ramifications and debt and those things and that's another discussion point um but no i'm not worried about it i say sit back be 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 attentive and watch it but yeah for you two we're but i would have it all ready to go okay i would have all mm-hmm. of your forms ready to go all of your employee history for the past 12 months 2019 is what you're going to be utilizing businesses that don't have 2019 data is going to be using january through february 15th data right get your employee information together get your benefit information together get how much you get paid up to a hundred thousand dollars as owners together get how much you pay in pension contributions together get your health insurance contributions together get your independent contractor amounts together get it all wrapped up sitting on a and get the application filled out ready to go right so mm-hmm. when it's go time you ready to get knock in. it down you know crap yeah. like crazy today on april april fool's day right april 1st right and prep it like crazy get it ready to go and then watch and see, because I fully think, man, I mean, they're talking about projecting that, you know, we're going to have the worst two weeks ever with up to 150,000 mm-hmm. deaths because yeah. of this, you know, that, and then potentially the line flattening by the 30th of April. Well, how long is it going to take for the, for the flatten line to go down where they can right. release yep. us back out there to the population? And we're probably all another, itching. I probably mean, another four weeks, man, four weeks. Yeah, we're going to be the spring breakers on the beach down in Florida, and it's going to be a it's going to be a wild summer 2020. I promise you that. But I mean, I'm banking on 
now, and I'm not to ring a panic bell, I'm just planning on for our practices that, you know, I, we directly manage and work through. I'm going, Hey man, we got to start planning on July 6th. And I've been saying May 4th, <laughs> right. The whole time wait. I'm sitting here thinking I'm planning for the long game. If it comes back. Uh, early, wait, 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 wait a second. Hold on. Whoa. Ah. Stop. Stop right now. Okay. Cause my Did stomach just, say, just flipped. <laughs> Did you say July? Is that what you just said? <laughs> Man, I'm oh, telling you, Chris. Virginia shut down till, till June 10th. Florida's right behind it, right? I'm just, oh, I'm, just, I'm planning for the long game. I, hey, here's the thing. Well, I hope and they're I'm saying the most, Florida is going to be the next huge problem Hot spot. And after New York, you Gosh. know, because of the older population. And, and you know, I mean, what at what point is that going to be an issue in our in our state, even if it's not, you know, as big of a, of a thing? You, when you look at these other countries, I mean, that's the thing I think we, we kind of forget about these other countries. You know, yeah. you look at Spain and Italy now, you know, Spain is getting crushed right now. Italy is maybe is just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Italy's maybe just coming over the hump, uh, maybe. Uh, and that's been a solid four weeks uh, of, of hell over there. And is that gonna be something that uh, we're gonna see here? Well, why would we not? You know, we're not doing much different. In fact, some people would argue we're doing less. It depends on who you talk to. Um, but I, I want to come back one more time because I, I know we're tangenting off on these various things and I'm going to just pretend, la, 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 you did not say July, but you're probably <laughs> right. Um, but let's just say I, I want to just... I correct statement I've ever made. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I hope you're I'm wrong. I hope you're wrong. Uh, but, I, but I get it. <laughs> I get too. the logic behind it and I just don't want to admit that. I don't want to admit Gosh, I'm going to need more it. coffee, John. <laughs> yeah. More coffee and kombucha. Shirt. I need one of Chris's shirts is what I need. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> oh my goodness. But, but you know, here's, here's the thing I want to go back to one more time because I think it's important to hit this point and yeah. hit it and hit it and hit it because people are like, but what, but what if, but what if the money runs out? What if, but yeah. let's just say, Chris, that you got the money Again, let's let's hit this again. If you get the money this Friday, you get it. You have it all. You they give you. Let's just say they give you hundred thousand dollars. Let's use that number. Well, if they give you hundred thousand dollars, the only things that's going to be forgiven from that money that you use is payroll expenses, basically, and a few other mm -hmm. smaller things. Well, if if you're not working, what are you going to do? Put your team back on the payroll and do what? And do what? And they're going to do what? Are they going to, I mean, yeah, there's a few things they can do. Maybe they can write a standard operating procedure manual for you and work a couple hours. I, I mean, I don't know what, how, at some point you run out of things to do. So, but if you don't put your team back to work, let's say you get a hundred thousand dollars, you, you say, well, guys, sorry, we're going to keep you in unemployment. You maybe use a few thousand dollars of that on your rent if you need to, or your utilities. And now you owe the rest of that as a non-forgivable loan, right? I mean, you could actually end up not only not using the money, but it's not like you don't use it and you just give it back. I mean, you oh, you use that and now that is that becomes a loan. Now, yeah, you can pay it back, but I mean, that is now loan money you owe and you miss out on the entire point of this, which is, as you said, yeah. the free lunch. Yeah, it, it, exactly. I mean, again, if they get funded Friday, they have to spend it to be forgiven with the free lunch. <laughs> what? By May 29th, are we going back to practice? Are we practicing on June 1st? I hope so. The only way I see that happening is that they come out with a 90% or greater cure, right? Where they've got this thing where they can cure everything. And I don't see that happening because I don't think it's necessarily curing COVID. I think people, you know, they're not dying because of COVID. They're dying with COVID, right? It's people with diabetes, people with cardiovascular disease, people with kidney issues and, you know, that are just falling like crazy on this. And even if they come out with a cure for the, you know, I, that's the only way I see it happening. And yeah, you don't want to sit there and put your employees on payroll to get the free money when you're on a stay at home order, when you're on a mandatory government or governor or recommended, which pretty much is mandatory. You do the If you go against the recommendations, better get increase your employer liability insurance hmm. tomorrow, which I, I recommend everybody call your insurance uh, mm. companies and look at doing that. Yeah. Just because Something John, John, um, you told me yesterday, I, you I talked think, to file a claim. There's, so there's national, there's national law firms 
sounds kind of like Oregon and Oregon, but mm. that are out there already saying, call us if you, you know, and I'm like, great, yeah. here we go. Now, now to, to, to say, to finish what you were saying, Wes, yeah, what, what I did is, and this is just a little, probably doesn't really mean anything, but I talked to my insurance agent about my business owner's policy, which has a business interruption provision in it. Mm -hmm. Now the business interruption provision does probably not apply here because it's really, if your building gets damaged, like you get of a fire or, you know, a car runs into it or something and you can't use part of it or all of it, then there's some coverage. But, you know, I talked to him and I said, is there any benefit in, is there anything here to this? You know, and he said, you know, there's no harm in filing a claim for business interruption and just basically telling them, here's what my potential loss will be. He's like, mm -hmm. I don't expect anything necessarily from that, but it would not be a bad idea. He said for business owners to file these claims because, you know, the government's still trying to get the insurance industry to be somewhat on the hook for this. Uh, Chris, have you yep. seen anything on that? That's, that's the one thing that hasn't been a, really been tapped into. You haven't seen a lot of pressure. You know, the, the federal government has really pushed the banks to free up money. They've really pushed you know, unemployment rolls and done that. They haven't come in and subsidized insurance, right? So that's a whole other trough of money that can support a lot of this too. And I've seen where they're, they're coming in and clarifying you know, some of these riders that are on these policies. And I think <clears throat> I'm with you, John. You need to call your insurance uh, agent and review it and get any claims in that can be potentially paid just because I think that at some point that that war chest will open up too as some of the mm. business support. They're going to have, the, they're going to have their role They're You know, they're one of the stools, one of the legs of the stool and they haven't really been pushed to come in and support yet. But I think there's yeah. definitely some things potentially coming down the pipe. So let's talk about the seven B loan, yeah. right? Because we've <clears throat> talked about the seven A, the paycheck protection plan, because that's kind of the big, that's the big dog. But there's this seven B loan, which is, you know, the economic injury disaster loan. Um, and talk about what, who should be applying for that? Um, how has that changed since we kind of last talked? Has anything changed about the way you're viewing that? And where does that fit in with the strategy? Yeah, I'm recommending that all practices that have been economically impacted, which is everybody, um, recommend they apply for it, right? Again, right now I'm playing the game for the long haul and I'm playing it to get, get as much money that's not your money on the table to help supplement and support the business. Uh, because we just don't know how this plays out. We don't know when we go back. We don't know what it looks like when we go back. I mean, I'm very optimistic on both of those things, but you just don't know. So if you don't know, you know, let's manage the risk. Let's manage our personal and our practice risk and go get any resources that we can easily obtain. And the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, right now, if you go on, they have a streamlined application on the SBA website, it takes about 90 minutes to do, uh, is I recommend going and getting it. They say within, within 72 hours, you'll have $10,000 dropped into your bank account. Hey, $10,000 is, is a little bit of Ambien, a little bit of Tums right now, right? Um, you know, again, every, and that, that comes through, they'll basically give 25000 pretty much unsecured. After $25,000, any amount they fund will be subject to tr traditional SBA lending requirements. Um, and they'll, they'll have you guarantee it. And they want real estate collateral if they can get it. Um, and that's fine. But <clears throat> I think you should go get it and have it sitting there. And they're talking about if you get the EIDL loan, and then when you go for the PPP, you can roll it into the PPP loan, which is at 4%, 10 years, six months deferral on payments. But I, again, I don't know if that's going to be the right recipe either, because as I read it right now, the EIDL loan is sitting on a 30 year AM schedule at three and a half percent. So we talked about insurance companies where insurance companies make money is in what's called the arbitrage, right? That is how much it costs them to get money versus how much they can make in the market. And that difference is the profit margin. It's the arbitrage. So <clears throat> I'm not saying to do this, but hypothetically, if you go get $100,000 in EIDL money and it's sitting there in your coffers to help support your business, 
and you get through this and don't need it, you might drop it with your broker, drop, drop it with Justin Goodbread <laughs> and uh, let it sit there for 10 years and see how much money you make. Wow, because that's an interesting thought here that I want to just kind of recap that idea. So the thought is, is that there's really no downside to that first 10,000. It's, it's a grant, it's free money, it's going to get rolled into the Paycheck Protection Program loan. So you really don't have any downside there. But the government determines how much you can qualify with this for with a 7B loan. So you could potentially go in there and take the max you could be qualified for. And worst case scenario, either you pay that back immediately if you want, or you turn that into a 30-year amortized loan at 3.75. And if you look at your crystal ball or your broker does and says, hey, I, I foresee a 75% uptick in the market in the next year, if that's what you think, um, that 3.75% you're paying on that, you're saying that if you returned 20% in the market or 30%, whatever, that that's a decent return <laughs> on this capital that essentially you know you're most likely you know having lower risk than if you, you know even a typical practice loan it's hard to get down to 3.75 percent it's free money i mean again it's within the historical inflation rates right hmm. so uh, wow well that that's that's a next level stuff. strategy there definitely talk to your your broker about that you know because it's an area or you know whoever you manages your money or if it's you think about that it's interesting thought um, I'm definitely, you know, going to be applying for the 7B simply because it, like Chris said, it's a little bit more ambient and Tums to help us to sleep better and know that, that we have that extra, there's nothing better than when the bank says, Hey, that line of credit, I just dropped that in your checking account. You know, even if you don't need it, it's just having it there makes us sleep better. So up to this point, let's do like a quick recap. And I'm going to turn it over to Wes for another question from our one of our listeners. Um, so up to this point, we've basically said unemployment. For those who are kind of joined us later on in the in the live stream here, we've said that unemployment benefits are you know coming into play, but we're delayed uh, for at least uh, you know ten days and getting maybe certified, and then maybe a couple more weeks, maybe a month total until people are getting benefits. But but we do expect they'll get retroactive pay. We've talked about the seven A loan that you might want to wait to apply for it so that you are, well, probably you should wait because the risk of getting the money too early is a problem with uh, not being able to use that free money for forgiveness. And then we've talked about the 7B loan, that it's something that you should tap into and even maybe consider with the generous terms that come along with it uh, long-term, that it could be a long-term source of capital uh, for kind of whatever you need in your business uh, for the next uh, the next little while. Um, Wes, why don't you take this question from uh, one of our listeners? I think it's a good one. So Will asks, can you have employees file unemployment under reduced hours rather than firing completely? That's the first part of his question. And will coronavirus unemployment cause premiums to increase moving forward? Yes and yes. Um, most states have partial unemployment benefits um, with this, uh, with the enhanced federal pandemic unemployment provisions. They have partial unemployment relief uh, there too. So if you reduce rates or reduce hours, uh, there is opportunities for them to file and potentially, I say potentially, uh, some uh, relief from that. So yeah, and it's state specific on how the calculations are done and state specific on what and how to do it. But most have that provision with partial unemployment, which is a, it's so a you're great saying question. somebody could work four hours a week, for instance, and if they work four hours a week, you could still draw from your unemployment and maybe just have some of that kind of deducted for the hours that they actually work something along those lines. Sure. Correct. Um, you know, it'll, it, what, that's, what you do on unemployment is they'll have a login. They'll tip most unemployment agencies. They'll go in weekly and report any earnings that they, that employee or that individual received that week. And you have to fill it out every week. And if you made earnings, it'll reduce the unemployment benefit, typically dollar per dollar. Um, but that's on the state level. 
It's my understanding, and again, as we see more clarification and guidance come out, that the federal pandemic unemployment, that 600, is flat, right? Hmm. So that won't be reduced from my understanding. And again, I'll put an asterisk that I'm not 100% sure, but that's my understanding of it anyway, okay? So, um, for instance, so, some of us do have employees, like, you know, that, like I, I do, <clears throat> that I've reduced they're hourly. I've got one person coming in just two hours a day, right? And and what is she, what is she doing? Well, there's still some insurance checks. There's payments coming in every day. Now you could go and run those deposits, right? Uh, yourself, if you know the system of doing that, you can run those down to the bank, or you can have one of your team members. But she's also managing phones, right? Mm-hmm. I mean. While we were here, she texted me about a patient. Every day, there's been questions. And I will say, the best thing you can do for your patients is somehow be available, right? Somehow somehow be available. And if you do that by reducing somebody to a couple hours a day, I mean, she's like doing eight hours a week. Chris, you and I have been talking about how we do that and um, really kind of setting her up for when she comes back that she's going to be better than ever, correct? Yep. Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, you bring up another, you made a point just there. I just want to hop in and sorry to split off of it, but you got to be available 100%. You got to have to stay connected with your patient base. And I think John, you mentioned earlier, you know, with these opportunities, one thing, you know, how this changes, I would recommend for every dental practice owner to at least have a weekly video that you send out through your revenue well, your Lighthouse 360, your smile reminder, or whatever mechanism with your current patient base saying, hey, this is what we're doing at Chris's Family Dental. You know, we're taking these precautions. We're here for you. This is what we're seeing. Please call us if you have any questions. And if you stay connected in that educational form with your current patient base, and even through some of your uh, communications through other channels to this overarching public, I think that's going to really set practices up for a really nice success run move versus just closing the doors. And like, like, like I said, Wes, and, you know, nobody there catching the phones or you go in once or twice a week to check the messages or you have hit option five for emergencies. This is the time that the more connected you get with your patient base and the more connected you get with your your area, the more they're going to be looking at you going, man, when we were all scared like crazy, when we were all stuck at home, Dr. Rogers and Dr. Mullins were going on there and saying, hey, guys, it's Dr. Rogers. I just wanted to say this is what we're doing at the practice. This is what's going on. I hope you're doing well. <clears throat> just little tidbits. It doesn't have to be a thesis. Two minutes, right? Yep. Anyway, we'll stay connected. And I think that yeah, having I think that's a great in, point. I mean, it would make sense to me. It's what any good business does during this time. I mean, if you look at what's happening with corporate America right now and how they're responding to this, uh, we should follow their lead by just, uh, you know, put they're putting out what I would consider to be very just positive, uplifting, connected type of advertising. It's not heavy duty. It's not really even trying to get you to buy. It's just, right. hey, we're here keeping us in their mind um, that we are important and they are important to us. And I think, mm-hmm. and they are, it's not like it's, yeah. it's a totally legit thing. I mean, you, you care about your people. You just want to let them know that. Now, the other side, part of that question that will asked, um, will coronavirus unemployment claims cause your unemployment rate or premium rate to increase moving forward? You said yes to that. Is that right? Yeah. I don't see another way, way it works. Uh, they're gonna have to replenish the unemployment banks materially they're gonna have federal money to help them with that but i would i would dare say and they'll put a cap it's, i don't think it's gonna come in and be like triple or double but yeah I fully anticipate that your your unemployment rates and the wage base will likely go up you know it used to be the first seven thousand then it went to the first nine thousand it may go up to the first fifteen thousand and your rate doesn't change or your rate only goes up a little bit but your effective expenses for a state unemployment i would i would probably forecast at least a 35 percent increase Here's room. a great here's a great question. Thirty what'd you just say there? How many percent? Thirty-five. Thirty-five percent increase. So like if you're paying a rate of like two percent right now, you're gonna be paying like two point six percent, you know, in the in the future. Um so yeah. you can kind of bank on that. I mean, we're gonna have to pay for this somehow, right? Yeah. Uh, makes sense. The two two trillion dollars here that's going out and uh where where it's coming from, you know, that's another question. So um here's for another show, right? So here's yeah. a great question. 
can you also uh, please tell me if, and this is from, uh, uh, I'm not going to, yeah, Hafsa, can you please tell if there are any provisions that might benefit associate dentists who are independent contractors? Appreciate the question. Yes. Um, being an independent contractor, you are in, in business for yourself. You have a business. You should be filing a Schedule C and taking home office deductions and mileage and cell phones and, and really utilizing um, the independent contractor status. I love independent contractors. Independent contractors, if done the right way, can make more money and the practice makes more money if it's set up the correct way. That's a whole other podcast, right? Um, mm-hmm. So you have an opportunity to potentially apply for some of these loans. You have opportunity to file for unemployment. So there is definitely relief in there for independent contractors um, as it as it is. You just want to reach out to your advisors and say, hey, I'm an independent contractor. What is there for me? And uh, definitely do your due diligence. But there are definitely mechanisms to help the independent contractors uh, through this. Okay, good. Another mm-hmm. question that's maybe more for you and I, Wes, is what are your thoughts on having COVID-19 tests available at the office because they're now available for purchase? And I think- Well, let, well let's stop I think for it's, just a second. Yeah, let's it's wait. It's coming, for, but that's, okay, that's coming. maybe a whole other show we need to that's do. That's kind of a whole on, other show. Yeah, because right? we so can get let into me the ask high weeds on that. We could get in the high weeds, and what are you doing now as far as emergencies that would require a test, right? I think mm-hmm. that- you know, I called my oral surgeon, who is a big multi-doctor practice the other day, and I said, what are you guys doing right now? And yeah. Unless there's pain with swelling and trauma, like we're talking about like really bad stuff here, right? Mm-hmm. Like diffuse swellings. Uh, you know, I'll use this as an example. Um, whenever being a part of a hospital, right, I'm a part of a, a medical center here in Knoxville, And our policy is, you know, when somebody walks into urgent care, right, what what constitutes a true dental emergency at this time is the same thing we've done for years, right? It's a diffuse swelling where I'm having trouble swallowing. My eyes going to swell shut. I'm losing filling my tongue. I'm having trouble drinking or swallowing, right? Those are true dental emergencies that might require you to see a patient. Now, what if a temporary comes off, John? Right. What if right. Uh, what if a patient breaks a tooth, but they're not in pain? It's just sharp to their tongue. Do you go in and use a high speed handpiece and or do you put some even temporary material on there? Right. We know that we had a podcast just recently um, live stream um, with a expert. With Mary Gavoni. Right? Yeah. Mary Gavoni. You need to go back and watch that because she talks about really what you should be doing right now if you have to see a patient. And really, there's not a lot you really need to be seeing. To me, it's like the hospitalist approach, right? You Mm want to keep these people out of the hospital. So if there's diffuse swelling, if they're if they're having trouble swallowing or drinking, I think the short answer here on this podcast is that yeah, testing is probably available. How you even mitigate that? That's for another show. Yeah, I think it's for another show. And and the the one thing I'll maybe leave with that is yes, I would agree with Wes. Answer number one is don't go to your office, right? I mean. Let's, let's be, let's, let's first of all, just be reasonable here. You're putting yourself at risk, your family at risk, your, your team at risk. Uh, You don't want Even if you test, let's say you could, I mean, I'm just, I don't want to go, I'm not going to go in the high weeds, but let's say you can test, right? Right. Let's say you can test. Well, well, if that patient has walked into your office and you get a positive test, what are you going to do then? What are you well, going to do then? Are you don't know for five or 10 minutes, it, even if you have a lab next door to you. Yeah, I mean, know? I think that time is coming in our practices where we may have to test people and we may right. have to have a mechanism to, you know, triage people, test people, keep make sure our teams are protected and safe. Uh, but in, We're going to do an we update. Like a real, I'll tell you what. Here, here's yeah, the show. Yeah. Here's the show. We're going to have Mary back on, right? Yeah. When all the dust settles, hands right. down, we will have. Now, she has. Because you know OSHA and OSAP and CDC are going to come out with, you know, official oh, yeah. recommendations, ADA. So we're going to break on, that down to you. Yeah. All of that. Yeah. So we'll be back with that. It's a great, great question. question. Don't, I don't, great we don't want to like down, down downplay it. It's the super important <laughs> question. But I think if. There are some people, though, that are asking that because they're trying to find reasons to go in. And I get it. I mean, we all want to be working right now, but I think we have to think about the bigger picture. Yeah, you're right. Well, I think that just, you know, go ahead, Chris. I think that, you know, one thing that we can definitely bank on is 
standard of care and clinical protocols and mandatory compliance will change due to this due to this pandemic and improve but there will likely be required changes in a, a practices operations that requires them to be much more um, uh, preventative in, in in terms of exposure to these types of things that being said how this how this podcast applies is the eidl right you have the money sitting there that you applied for that you didn't know if you necessarily need. If you have to have pure air operatories or if you have to have certain things that are part of a compliance deal, you've got the money to go do it. Ready, click, boom. Right. <laughs> Versus go go to a bank after this whole thing happened. And good luck getting <clears throat> traditional loans there for a minute. Right. Because they're all going to have yeah. to take a breath for 30, 60, 90 days. I'm not talking a long time, but if you have the money and funds there and I think that's where maybe not innovators, but early adopters can get out there and grab market share, right? If that's you want to grab market share point. in your area, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, think about this. The, the next level. But think about this, guys. I mean, if, if, I mean, I think all of us know down deep that we're going to have to change some things. And, and that could be as little as, you know, N95 masks, or that could be as big as HEPA air filtration and some way of having better air circulation or operatories our reception areas may have to change um, what are you going to do if those regulations come down and it means a difference between you going back into practice and i think the key is flexibility mm. in funding is going to be the key and if you could look again back at a 3.75 percent at 30 year loan mm. versus a equipment loan at you know five percent over yeah, four and a half to five, five years yeah you know then the money just doesn't make sense and that's a great point that chris is making here that you might want to look at this eidl loan not only as a loan that is good for now but maybe as something to have for the long run and in your back pocket because the unknown of what kind of capital investments we're going to have to make into our practices is definitely i feel like i don't think that's crystal ball i think that's reality i just don't know exactly what that's going to mean um and i sure would like to have that uh sitting in my in my back pocket and and that's changing just as we're saying that chris it's kind of changing the way i'm thinking uh just as we're speaking now because this is i mean this is right on the bleeding edge right now of our thought process of what comes next and man i mean that's a big change yeah you know i think um, it's all things that, again, I, I recommended the other day, you know, dentists are visual learners, Chris, you know this, right? They like, they can like see things like if they can touch it. Right. And so one of the things that I've been doing is I've been like taking a piece of paper and just putting some boxes on it. Right. And just a little like organizational chart to kind of help kind of put all this together because as we gather more information it's a little easier to digest if you can kind of see it in front of you like everything we receive is pdfs and it's digital but there's still nothing you know we touch stuff every day and i think it will help you john there's another question yeah. that came up i think it's yeah really and this one. is probably a good question to close with uh to respect your time chris but um another good question here what are your thoughts with dentists who are looking to buy a practice within the next four months will there still be purchase opportunities or will there even be job slash associate opportunities um we talked about this a little bit before the show i mean chris again this is crystal ball stuff but what would be your feeling or your advice to somebody who's asking about purchasing or even job opportunities I think that there will definitely definitely be both. Again, what I'm seeing right now is it, it's interesting. I've gotten emails from multiple demographics, multiple places saying there's a lot of practices for sale right now. There's a lot of practices going for sale and I haven't put my finger on it. But uh, yeah, I think there's definitely definitely options and it's a supply and demand thing. And the more the less practices for sale, the higher the price, right? The less the more practices for sale, the less the price or the multiples. Um, and depending on, and we talked about this, you know, previously off the grid is, you know, you talked about how does this affect DSOs and venture capital, you know, depending on how the markets and if they go you're just bullish crazy, there's going to be a lot of investment into that side too, coming in and wanting to grab practices. So I think it's going to be a very exciting time to be a dentist. It's a very exciting time to be an associate. And more importantly, it's a great time to go look at practice opportunities 
Um, I think you'll probably see some fatigue too from some of the boomers. Now, a lot of the boomers are ready for, to retire in 2006. They had, a, mm. you know, 2 million in their 401k. And then 2007, eight happened and that went down to 800,000. And then a lot of them pulled the money out of the market. Like everybody says, don't do. And they did. And they didn't catch the rebound and they had to work for five more years, six more years. They've come through in 2013. They brought in their first associate that with the transition plan and they did the valuation on the front end and the equity earn in and the, the, the operating agreements and the reverse employment agreements for the, the senior doc when they sell. And then that fell through. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, you know, so I think that after this, you might look at a lot of them going, Hey man, it's been a wild ride, but I'm, I'm ready to slow it down and maybe look at life a little differently and get to the beach and enjoy the grandkids kind of thing. Yeah, I think that might be a great point that the, mm -hmm. the boomers who historically now for boomers listening to this, we love you, but you guys have historically been that generation that's kind of seen these ups and downs and sometimes is like sold at, you know, at the wrong time. And that's what happened like to a lot of them back at that time. And it, it wasn't just boomers, it was all across. But, you know, if if they learned from that time during yeah. the recession and didn't have their money in super you know, uh, volatile investments or high risk investments, they may be in, still in a pretty good situation right now and ready to say, you know what? Um, I don't want to go through another rebuilding or another change. Uh, you know, change is hard and, and this is going to be a change. And like you say though, Chris, with that comes opportunity and I would not be surprised if there are some good deals. Now, as far as associate jobs though, that that's another maybe question. I don't know. I mean, I know a lot Man. of DSOs right now, for instance, are laying off associates left and right. I'm hearing these stories that, I mean, because the work's not there. I mean, I get it. It's not like anybody's doing anything wrong. It's not just DSOs either. It's it's practices across the board. Um, and, and how many of those associates are going to be, you know, uh, finding to be able to come right back? So there's a lot of questions that still remain on that. And, and I think it's going to be an interesting time. But the opportunities are there. And this is where, you know, having good advisors, you know, one of the reasons we have Chris on here is because I think in the end, I mean, if you've heard enough to, to know today that we don't have all the answers and, you know, Chris is even challenging us to think differently about things uh, today. So, you know, make sure you have a good team, mm -hmm. make sure you have people that are advising you on how to handle this for your specific practice situation because we are all in these different situations, independent contractors, associates, owners, you know, people just getting out of school that don't know what they're going to do. Everybody's in a different situation. Make sure you have a good team. And um, I think this has been a great discussion with that. And Chris, yeah. before we close the show, let, let people know where they can find out about you. Oh, sure. Um, go to our website at www.mayhanassociates.com. Um, or you can email me at Chris, C-H-R-I-S, at Mahan, M-A-H-A-N, associates.com. And, uh, man, we're here to help. So if you have a question, anything, just please, you know, send it our way. We're all, like you said, John, we're all learning day by day collectively through this, through this environment. And, you know, I, I really appreciate our relationships and the relationships with a lot of our other uh, people that we mastermind with just to find the opportunities because they are abound. They are everywhere. For example, DSOs kick out some associates because they're trying to get leaner after this. Some of these DSOs really <laughs> invest heavily in their associate training and their associate education and clinical establishment. There may be A-level associates out there ready to grab. And if you've got the capital and the wherewithal and you want to get another practice, the whole thing with a secondary and a, and a third practice, the whole thing with having additional practices from an entrepreneurial aspect, it's all about the doc. So if we've got a potential abundance of good doctors that have been highly trained and can mm -hmm. do some really good clinical work, this may be another opportunity for some people that have been on the fence wondering, no, if they want to go get another office, right? If Ooh, the offices sounds like are a whole other themselves. podcast, man. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Let me just yeah. say this is that if, if you're listening to this and you had questions that we didn't answer, and I really appreciate Chris coming on the show. And there are a few questions that we didn't get to, and we'll see if Chris can respond to those. We'll see if we can get answers for you. We're going to be bringing you more content just like this. I mean, there's going to be more shows that are non-clinical based, right? And we're going to put this show out on our regular podcast feed. So you'll get this on Apple Podcast in audio format. There'll be a YouTube feed that'll jump out from this. So 
I guys, I want you to know that this will be available for you uh, in those formats. So the way that people find out about this is if you share, like, subscribe, all those things. We're trying to do the best that we can to bring you the most up-to-date uh, information when it comes to these things and there's some clinical things that we're putting out there too and I know you guys are going to be super excited about that we recorded some stuff about what's going on with Brad the dental lab guy and lab day and what's going on with you know him in the COVID crisis and and those things are being released as well and we've got a special uh, closing episode yesterday uh, zero bone loss concepts so there's a uh, so much content for you to digest during this downtime and the way people find out about it like we said is the like share I appreciate everyone that joined the live stream today it was so good to see you all we had a lot of viewers and um, tell your friends about the dental guys again I really appreciate Chris for being on the show and so for uh, for Chris for John I'm Wes and we are the dental guys <laughs>